Hi, everybody. Um, thank you all for joining us. Um, I want to keep us on time because we have a lot of interesting people. I am loud. That's amazing. We got to be a little quieter. Um, we have a lot of people. So um, we're going to kind of try to get started. So welcome to uh, our session, Climate Related Migration in the Private Sector, Part 1. How did we get here? So my name is Patrick Marchman. Um, I'm going to be the host slash moderator for this first part. And um, let's get the show on the road. Why does this not work? It's not work. Excuse me? I hope so. All right. Uh, this is not uh, working. How do I how do I do that? Thanks. Awesome. Well, there we, uh, there we go. Actually, that slide should be in, in a second. But uh, anyway, um, yeah, thanks a lot for joining us. Um, I'm gonna step back. Uh, so yeah, this is um, this is an interesting session in that you know a lot of you know probably the majority of sessions we've had and discussions of the manager treat uh, field are generally around public sector money things like that. And I think it's very very appropriate. Um, I'm very interested in it myself. However. Um, Increasingly, uh, the, the, how the private sector intersects and and kind of uh, acts as a factor in this is is you know it, it's really important, and I've been really gratified to see a lot of other people kind of thinking along those lines. And so we've tried to jam together a bunch of presentations into the session to give you kind of a flavor of where we're discussing. So when we talk about the private sector, we're thinking about things like real estate, we're thinking about insurance, we're thinking about finance. Um, we're really thinking about that sort of invisible infrastructure that really does have an impact on the shape of our world. Um, I can tell you, you know, it, it, some things that probably in the past couple of weeks, I think a lot of people have heard about um, what's happening in California, where uh, several large insurers have simply decided to stop writing new policies. Um, I kind of have a personal uh, uh, interest in that because I'm working on something in San Diego County right now, and a person I was working with very closely let me know about a week ago in an email that not only himself, but apparently the population of his town in North San Diego County, um, is, they're almost well getting blanket, blanketed with notices that their insurance is being dropped. Now, um, you know, they'll find insurance, but I'm sure they will, but it may not be as good. It may not be, you know, as comprehensive. And that will be a lot more expensive. And so it's kind of getting out of the realm of, frankly, people like us and more into the realm of like everyone. Ordinary people are starting to notice that something is up. So let's see if I can make this work this time. Awesome. Okay. So our first panel, we're going to have um, several uh, really interesting speakers here. Number one, uh, we have Liz Russell from the Environmental Defense Fund, um, State Director out of Louisiana. We have Haley Gentry, the Senior Research Fellow at Tulane Water Law Institute, also in Louisiana and New Orleans. We have Calandra, Calandra Crookshank, sorry about that, um, CEO of Statebook International. Um, and we have Greg Lindsay, we have um, Senior Advisor with Climate Alpha. And then you have me, I do a bunch of things, I'm the moderator. All right, so I'm gonna hand it over. The way we're gonna do this, each speaker is gonna come up, do their thing, and then we're gonna, um, when we get done with this, we're all gonna come up and we'll have some moderated questions and then open it up to all of you, all, all of you good people. So without further ado, Liz. Go ahead and do this. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. That's loud. Great. So thanks so much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being a part of this discussion, the conference, and, and also this afternoon. I'm Liz Russell. I'm the State Director for Environmental Defense Fund at uh, I'm sorry, for Louisiana at Environmental Defense Fund, which means I have the privilege of working on every facet of climate work that EDF does in Louisiana, um, ranging from everything from emissions mitigation, carbon capture, all the way to insurance and managed retreat uh, or coastal restoration. So um, I want to start uh, really by laying a bit of groundwork about Louisiana. And I'm telling you this, I'm telling you about Louisiana, we're telling you about Louisiana, not because... I want you to look at Louisiana and think, wow, look how screwed Louisiana is, or because I want you to come solve for Louisiana's challenges, because that's not the question either. Um, Louisiana is the bleeding edge of every facet of our climate reality, um, and the ripple effects and crises that we are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis 
um, already in the state, not a future scenario, um, are not something that should feel so distant for you. Um, and I don't wanna tell you about Louisiana because I want you to want to come help us. I want you to understand that wherever you are, wherever you are working in whatever place, our destinies are tied together. Um, and the steps that we can take in Louisiana to decarbonize or the steps that we can take in Louisiana to figure out how we adapt to these challenges are linked to the steps that we will take everywhere to actually address these things. I wanna start with this map um, that I have, which is actually uh, in the background, obviously, illustrating population movement um, from the 2000 to 2010 year, obviously including hurricanes Katrina, Rita, Gustav um, in particular, and then culminating in the BP oil spill uh, in 2010. Um, you see again behind the black um, that there are areas already losing significant portions of the population. Um, and then there are areas already gaining population. Um, again, this is way back in the 2010 census. Um, these are decisions that are being made in a really haphazard way. These are decisions where uh, people with the financial or social resources to be able to move in many cases are doing so. Um, people who have the resources to move to what they perceive as higher and safer grounds are then shifting local tax bases, access to resources more broadly. So in the areas losing population, we're already seeing declines in ability to maintain social services, ability to maintain infrastructure, um, ability to uh, mitigate, uh, invest in existing risk mitigation measures, much less invest in new infrastructure with those tax bases. And then also on the the inverse of that in those areas perceived to remain high and dry, we're seeing uh, development expand without any regard for where water goes or is likely to go, um, uh, wanting to accommodate uh, from a private, perspe private sector perspective um, that growing uh, sort of real estate mindset, right? So schools are swelling, traffic swells, um, development uh, being sort of expanding wildly across from the high ground out into the floodplains and lower lower lying areas. Um, this is 2010 data. Again, I wanna say that because we're gonna circle back because these trends are not yet. Oh, I have a clicker. Where is that? Ah, oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, so much better. So uh, I wanna highlight these six parishes um, because as of 2018, eight and a half percent of the federal uh, flood insurance payouts were in these six parishes in Southeast Louisiana. Um, and at that point in time, again, the data is a few years old, you can see that almost a third of, of the federal payouts were in Louisiana alone. Uh, Louisiana drains 41% of the country. The Mississippi River Basin all comes through the state. Uh, the land was built by the Mississippi River over thousands of years and indigenous peoples had no challenges sort of navigating those systems and being able to accommodate the dynamic nature of the wetland ecosystem. Um, following colonization, we levied off the river. We've made a series of decisions to manage and mismanage that ecosystem. And then we allowed pervasive development of oil and gas infrastructure and expansion of development, expansion of maritime uh, channelization, et cetera. Um, but I highlight this because there's not a single parish in the state of Louisiana that hasn't been under a federal climate disaster um, in recent years. In many cases, it's four, five, six, seven, eight federal, federal, federally declared disasters. We have made tremendous progress following the state, uh, following Katrina and Rita in 2005, the state made initial investments in our coastal master plan. We re-up this plan every five, um, six years now, every six years, thank you, Allie. <laughs> we legislatively changed that, uh, but, uh, we are investing billions of dollars, some of which is from the BP Deepwater Horizon settlement, uh, to be able to reduce our risk, both from structural mitigation, um, non-structural mitigation, reconnecting the river to her delta, um, and, and reconnecting some of those dynamic processes. I wanted to highlight that because even with $50 billion of investment in the coastal master plan, 
the footprint of Louisiana still looks smaller than it does today, right? Um, by 2067. Um, but you can start to see uh, areas where these investments in all types of risk reduction are meaning that we have a longer uh, pathway to consider transitioning in some of these areas that are vulnerable. And uh, Louisiana, different from many other coastal players, places around the country is very much a working coast where people live where they live, not because of recreation or tourism necessarily, but because um, their jobs have them there, whether that is seafood industry, whether that is oil and gas or um, maritime commerce, all of that is really connected to our working coast. I want to um, end here and I want to uh, share a little bit. So I'm, I'm going to dive into the realities of this condition a little bit more because um, Hurricane Ida, Hurricane Laura, Hurricane Delta, Zeta in the last three years um, really put entire other pressures on the state. Um, this data is, uh, I've been told to say, very much in draft form, but but being finalized by the data center out of uh, New Orleans does really incredible work um, uh, managing, uh, I'm sorry, mapping how racialized inequalities show up uh, in data as they're manifested from policy decisions, coastal economies, how we have opportunities to grow. Um, I want to highlight this because this is the 2010 tw um, to 2020 uh, migration data from the census. And what you actually see is not uh, widespread population loss from the most at-risk coastal areas that have seen disaster after disaster. Um, what you see is not just migration to those areas that are perceived to be high and dry, although you see a lot of that on the North Shore um, in those orange areas above Lake Pontchartrain. We see more population loss in North Louisiana than we see in South Louisiana, which is extremely susceptible to flood risk. Um, so I just wanna have that, have that in the back of your mind um, because I wanna talk through a little bit of what has happened in the last few years. Um, following, following Hurricane Ida, where most of Southern Louisiana was without power for minimum seven to eight days, most places in rural South Louisiana, weeks without water for weeks. In Tyrebone Parish, two high schools have been shut down. Uh, so the school options are for those kids, you have to bus the, all of the kids from the parish to the two, school, two public high schools that still exist. So to accommodate this shift in ability to send your kids to school, um, half the high school kids go to school in the mornings and half the high school kids go to school in the afternoons and evenings. You can imagine that what that means for your social life, what that means for your ability to have um, participate in sports or have part of your community, it looks totally different when you're spending an hour plus on a bus because all of those parishes are by you um, up and down the fingers of the bayou. Um, when we talk about the private sector making decisions about Louisiana, right? When I have a resident who comes to me and says, Liz, I just need to not have to drive an hour to get fresh produce. When they tell me what they want, right? It's not, it's not, I, yes, absolutely. I would love some help getting elevation resources or maybe even some money for blood. But actually, I would just like to get a cup of coffee or not have to drive an hour to get a ripe tomato that's not from my garden because I can no longer grow it there because it's salt water. What they're telling me is like, why can't we get like a target here? It's like, I can't walk through all of the levels of decision-making that feed into why Target may or might, might not invest in which areas of Louisiana. Um, but these are tiny decisions that are over and over again occurring, right? The general store shut down to make way for the Dollar General, right? The Dollar General doesn't care if that person can't drive because they can't get gas because there's no power at the gas station to go get their food stamp card refilled at the to buy that food at the Dollar General. The person who used to be there in the small general store would have, they had a tab running for them. They had a post-it note. They knew how much. I got you. There are complete shifts that are forever entwined with human experience. Um, these not future scenarios, right? Um, 
it's people's lives. It's our lives. It is our friends, our family. As we talk about these insurance crises um, across Louisiana, this Patrick, your experience um, of having people just drop from their policies. We have 12 insurers who have gone bankrupt or left the state since Hurricane Ida in 2021. Um, as those went bankrupt, all of the people who had policies were immediately kicked onto the Louisiana Citizens, which is intended to be an insurer of last resort. They're required to charge 10% more than the lowest bottom common denominator of uh, insurance prices. Although if you can't get insurance because there's no insurance companies that will provide a policy, what's the lowest common denominator to charge 10% more than? Um, this is not distant. This happened to my mom, this happened to my coworker, right? Um, every person in Louisiana is within half a degree able to tell this story. Um, so I say all of that not to make you more depressed than you probably already were just in the context of everything that we're talking about, but um, also to highlight the reality of this because it's not as <laughs> modelable as we like to think when we look at these maps. Um, and sometimes we have to be closer to the reality of this, which is the reality of human experience. Um, people ask me, why, like, would you buy a house in New Orleans? That's where I'm from, by the way. Um, why, would, why did you have a kid <laughs> with all that you do and know? Um, there are things about Louisiana's future and Louisiana's reality that are really incredible. Louisiana is, is the product of the Mississippi River. Um, we have a land building machine. We already have a federal levy system. We're not trying to convince the federal government to start that investment now. It just got a $14 billion upgrade. We just had our whole grid fail. Maybe we're actually gonna make new uh, decisions about how to do distributed generation and respond to be able to get our power back online. But also <laughs> every single person in Louisiana knows what to do to make sure that they can feed their family when the power goes out. Every single person in Louisiana knows that you fill up your bathtub so that when the water pressure drops in the middle of a hurricane, you can refill the toilet so that you can flush it. They know to make sure that all your emergency papers, including your insurance, if you still have it, and your mortgage and your birth certificates and your passports, if you have them, are in a waterproof bag that you can just grab. And they know to make sure that the ice chests with everything that you're gonna want to eat now, while the power's out, more specifically, everything you're gonna want to drink <laughs> while we're playing the games, while the power's out, is in those eye shots. So you don't have to open the fridge because if you open the fridge, then you lose the power and you lose the cold. These are experiences that do not just transfer to other places when people won't leave their house because their deep freezer is full of all the shrimp and deer that they've been hunting, fishing, cook, cooking for months, years, generations. Like the notion of just moving to that area that's perceived as higher and safer in Wisconsin or wherever looks really different. Um, so with that, I'll stop um, and thank you for your grace and your time because it's real and it's hard and it's messy and it is not confined to one sector or another. Hello, I'm Kalandra Crickshank. I'm founder and CEO of Statebook International, which is a location intelligence company. And what we do is we aggregate data from lots and lots of different sources, largely federal data. The federal data tends to be very, very siloed. So the census data does not work well with the Bureau of Labor Statistics or the Department of Education, Health, Housing, Transportation, Energy, the Tax Foundation, you name it. None of those sources work and play well together. And yet all of this data is desperately needed for informing climate risk, informing mitigation strategies, and understanding how people are moving around the country in reaction to this, what businesses and industries are affected and so forth. So we aggregate over 32 billion data points 
We normalize this data across the entire US down to the census tract and block group level. So for those of you who aren't familiar with those terms, if you think of 50 states, 3,200 approximately counties or county equivalents, each county is divided up into census tracts, which is then divided up into block groups, which is then divided up into city blocks. So we normalize all of this data. We make it searchable, filterable, and comparable across the entire US and make it available for strategic decision-making and understanding what the risks are. Um, our data can be visualized in a million different ways um, to make it very easily accessible and absorbable and used for any of this decision-making. So Statebook was actually formed originally to address economic development and on the private side, um, working with corporate site selection groups and Fortune 500 companies looking for where to move a headquarters or where to locate a new manufacturing facility, that kind of thing. And these days, it's instead of expansion and relocation for businesses, it's all about uh, disposition and consolidation on the real estate side because companies really aren't um, expanding as much as they were before. And instead with the impacts of COVID and natural disasters and all kinds of other impacts, um, they are much more focused on downsizing their real estate footprint, which is a whole other thing. But lately, climate change has started to dramatically impact the location decision-making on the business side, right? So from the private sector, we're looking at a whole different angle of decision-making. Um, probably about six or seven years ago, I presented flood risk technology that we were integrating into Statebook to FEMA, uh, HUD, and Fannie Mae. And I also presented it to a lot of the four, Fortune 500 companies that we work with, and they all took a free report to understand and be able to assess what the blood risk was to some of their portfolio locations. But then they said, oh, $10,000 for a flood risk report that will tell me what my risk is today and 15 years from now and 30 years from now. We can't, we can't justify $10,000. Our, our Fortune 500 business, which is making decisions about site locations worth hundreds of millions of dollars, can't justify a $10,000 one-time expense, right? So cut to today, suddenly that's an incredibly attractive offer and everybody is taking that into consideration when they're making their site selection decisions. And then just you know, a couple of weeks ago here in New York, the Canadian wildfires making New York City in, inhabitable and even where I live up in the Catskill Mountains since I vacated the city when COVID hit, um, you know, we couldn't breathe there either and bought air purifiers. And so these impacts are felt at the business level. They're obviously felt at our own personal levels. And there's a lot to consider here. And it's, it's a dynamic confluence of risks, right? So there's climate change, there's pandemic risk, there's inflation, there's political risk, and all of the different subsets of decisions that go into this. It's a very complex ecosystem, and you can't really focus on one without the others. So there's a lot of different decision making that needs to go on, and there's a lot of different impacts that are really changing the way that we fundamentally think about these issues, and especially where we live, where we work, where we're going to play, et cetera. Affordable housing gets its own slide because this issue has become so enormous as it relates to climate change and migration. Um, in the US, there is a shortage of 7.3 million affordable homes. Population growth is not keeping up with the, well, the, the new builds, new housing starts is not keeping up with population growth. Half of American renters pay more than 30% of their annual, annual household income on their rent. Anything above 30% is considered, you know, you're not solvent, you have no savings, you're living month to month. 
and want you here in the news all the time. One health emergency, one natural disaster, one step away at any given time of not being able to uh, maintain your home. And then more than a quarter of Americans spend more than 50%. So that's even further exacerbating the problem. Um, to me, this looks like a third world country, but this is the US, this photo um, in a recent headline. So 600 people, 600 million people globally already live outside of the optimal climate niche habitats that sustain life optimally, right? And one third to one half of people globally may be trapped outside of that zone by late this century. So those people moving being that on that scale, that number of people moving on that scale goes back to what Haley was just discussing about and, and Liz before that, about the fact that we're all going to be impacted by this. The, the amount of resources that we have on this planet are finite. The amount of space we have is finite, right? So these kinds of impacts are incredibly uh, to, here today and need to be addressed. And they need to be analyzed and the data needs to inform what decisions we're making. This whole concept of this yesterday, today, and, and tomorrow of this managed retreat is so imperative. And data plays a huge part in that because if we're not informed, we can't make the right decisions. We can't evaluate what the impacts will be as this becomes a global shift and a global problem. Three million Americans were displaced due to climate disasters last year. That's an extraordinary number of people moved from their homes. And we kind of tend to think about this as like, you know, it's a third world problem. It's a this, it's a that. You're hearing today about Louisiana and the case studies there. We just had them in New York last week with the wildfires, right? So sea levels rising, wildfires, droughts, heat, storms, riverine flooding. There are so many impacts that need to be measured, need to be tracked, need to be evaluated. And then the resource decisions about how do we replace these people and where do we put them and how do we share and spread resources. 13 million coastal Americans will relocate because of sea level rise alone by 2100. Sea level rises are projected to rise by an average of six feet by that point. And the majority of impact will be felt in pervasively disadvantaged areas. So one thing that I think is actually incredibly encouraging, and I think it largely is as a result of the fact that the insurance industry is now stepping into this and the reinsurance industry, right? It's like the old adage of, you know, People didn't really care that the Vietnam War was going so crazy until middle-class white boys were drafted to go to war, right? So now all of a sudden our insurance is at risk, right? That hits each of us. And so now it becomes very quickly a pervasive discussion across the country and in the government and so forth. Today, there is more money, and I think, yeah, next slide. This is, there is more money coming down from the federal government than any point in history in this country since the New Deal. It is very encouraging to me that uh, the fact is the government is requiring, mandating that this money have a climate, or they call it resilience because they're not allowed to say climate, right? But... <laughs> They say they call it resilience so that it's not as politically charged, but every grant that is coming down from the federal government needs to have a resilience piece to it and needs to have a disadvantaged measurement. So the, the, the sort of rule of thumb is something like 60% of the funding will go to the 40% most disadvantaged and most at risk areas. And that will start to change the conversation of what is happening on the ground. Um, but at the same time, it's, it's a transformational amount of money that's coming down 
for resilience, for addressing climate change, for addressing the most disadvantaged areas with this funding, but it's ours to lose because there is a lot between that money coming down and actually having it allocated to the right programs in the right communities at the right time. And one of the really interesting pieces that we have seen in working with, we, we sit at Statebook in a very unique position because we work with economic development organizations all over the country. We work with um, Fortune 500 companies, real estate investment funds, head funds, banks, insurance companies, and reinsurance companies increasingly as they become more and more a part of this discussion and this equation. Um, and what we've seen is that economic developers on the ground don't know what, what to do. They are not chain, trained in climate migration and how to mitigate uh, uh, natural disaster hazards and so forth. Some of them are being forced into that, right? But as a whole, they're not being trained on this. They, they haven't been educated. They're the ones that are going to get this money. <laughs> and so it's a very interesting point. Um, that they don't have the experience to know what to do with it. And during, um, during the pandemic, the EDA had the EDA CARES Act funding that came down to all of the communities for COVID recovery. A third of small businesses closed. People were out of work. It was a national crisis for a variety of reasons outside of the health crisis that sort of caused it all. But what we saw as that money came down was that economic development organizations that were receiving the funding were like, uh, we don't know what COVID recovery looks like. So we'll just build a larger uh, sewage line to the industrial park and hope we can attract the new business here. So they were kind of doing business as usual. I presented to uh, about 25 chief resilience officers from some of the major cities across the country a few weeks ago. They did not know what to do with all of the money that's coming down from the federal government. And I said to them at, this, at the time, you know, you guys are the most educated in the country. You're supposed to know what to do with this funding. If you don't know, we're all in trouble, right? So, so there's a lot of education that needs to happen. And data and technology can absolutely help with this, right? But it's more fundamental than that. It's what is that data telling you? How do we understand what to do with it? And so with the insights. So, um, you know, we've integrated the FEMA National Risk Index. We've integrated the climate and the economic justice data so that you can use our data alongside like this screening data to identify the most at risk and most disadvantaged and then be able to um, use all the rest of the data that we have. Where are the school districts in relation to this? Where are the businesses? Whose job will be impacted? What kind of demographics are in each of these locations and how do those need to be addressed differently? But we still have to educate those local practitioners on the ground. And we've had a lot of discussion over the past two days about the fact that these decisions on climate migration need to be locally led. And I think that's absolutely true because people are very attached to their locations. They have historic and cultural significance and all of that. But that's not the same as understanding how to use information and funding and so forth to make the right, most educated and best decisions for your community. So all of those things need to come together. <laughs> Insurance is not a risk strategy. So you just heard from Haley, right? All of the details and the ins and outs of that. The reality is they're underwater and replacement costs for uh, insurance companies have increased more than 55%. The companies are underwater, the ratios are, are getting worse. Insurance can be removed at any second from any location. They don't have to continue those policies. And even when, like in Florida, they legislate that the insurance company cannot drop policies, then the insurance companies leave the state because they can't afford to be there. <laughs> 
Um, so we're all familiar with a lot of the different types of disasters that we've been facing and the fact that the disaster claim payouts are, are increasing and approaching astronomic levels or already surpassed astronomic levels um, and all of the different impacts that these things are, are happening. But if you take a step back and you look at the globe, we're all in this together, right? It's a finite location, it's a finite set of resources, and we need to really get creative and innovative on the approach to, to addressing them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Calagra. Um, I'm Greg Lindsay. Let's see, then going there. Um, I, I want to preface this by saying that I am speaking on my behalf today and that I am no longer a paid employee of Climate Alpha. So I'm going to talk a bit about. Uh, in the first half of this presentation, because I'm in the second panel as well, I want to talk about why we started the company, because uh, I'm part of the founding team, I was the chief communications officer, and really sort of our approach to this, which is, you know, climate alpha is what happens if you had someone from cap modeling, or someone from investment walk into this conference, and really drink all the Kool-Aid and come away with the idea of we've got to get the private sector to do this, and how do we use the private sector's tools to basically build more resilient geographies. And where climate alpha comes from, uh, comes from an op-ed that I co-wrote 10 years ago with my friend Parag Khanna, who founded the company, who's the CEO. Parag is, if you know his work, he is the very frequent author of many big books about globalization, some of which have been reviewed quite poorly by people like Evgeny Morozov and others. Um, but Prague and I basically sat down and wrote a book, wrote, wrote an op-ed about where will you live in 2050? We looked out that far. And, you know, we basically sort of spitballing between the two of us, looked at the idea that really the most advantageous geographies of the future would be those that combined a high baseline level of climate resilience, according to the modeling, along with very effective governance that could actually bring adaptation and financial resources to bear. So we chose some geographies. The punchline to that is that shortly thereafter, Prague moved to Singapore, taking one side of the bet in favor of governance and adaptation. And I moved my family to Montreal, taking the other side of the bet when it comes to it. But you know, Prague then, you know, also then wrote a whole book called Move. Uh, this is his whole epic book looking at large-scale human geography. Um, you know, obviously, you know, America and communities in Louisiana and Florida face incredible challenges, but nothing like the challenges potentially faced by, you know, by the subcontinent, Indian subcontinent, if the kind of wet bulb heat wave that Kim Stanley Robinson uses to open ministry for the future that kills 20 million people happens, or the kinds of climate shocks, uh, work done by the New England Complex Systems Institute to basically show how, of course, climate stress triggered the drought, that triggered the rise in food prices, that triggered the Syrian civil war in the Arab Spring. And now, of course, you have migrant waves entering Europe, which leads to the 2015 political disruptions. And now you have the EU paying $8 billion a year to basically build a gulag archipelago in Libya, as Ian Baruma and others have documented. So you have those kinds of shocks coming. And so Parag wrote about this. And what I think is interesting about Climate Alpha, when he then set out to operationalize this, and I'll come back to sort of the company's origins there, is that it was really driven by this vision of the future of humanity lies more north. It lies in areas that have higher baseline climate resilience, where we can adapt to. And it was the idea of, you know, if you do a classic sort of futurist two by two matrix that like, the, you know, the upper right quadrant, the Goldilocks scenario, as far as there is one, is the idea that we need to build a sort of new archipelago of civilization in these more climate resilient geographies. So we need to mobilize the resources to do that. And I think I probably share the political views of many of the people in the room, which is like, I would of course like to see very high tax rates to allow political, allow public sector motivation to do this in a just fashion. But even as we see with the Biden administration, the states with the IRA and the bipartisan infrastructure law, there's gonna be a lot more incentives and not so many sticks. It's gonna be mostly carrots to the private sector to get them to do this. And so Climate Alpha was started by Prague as a way of sort of, yeah, again, operation, operationalizing this idea. And the idea, of course, is to basically marry the climate models that have been developed. Climate Alpha does not really build any of its own models. It uses RCP, uh, but really marry that with a kind of socioeconomic variables and the sort of market analysis that really, in a way, gets to what Liz was talking about in her first talk, those questions of why is Target not here or where can I get a tomato? Those are the kinds of data questions that we're, we're actually working, we're partners with Calandra on this, and that we've sourced from a whole gumbo, so to speak, of data sets uh, that we basically sort of have picked together and merged together in our tool, not a black box, we're sort of a gray box because we do discuss some of how our model is constructed, but it's the idea of how do you create a tool that can combine both the climate side and the socioeconomic side to basically point out not only which communities are at a high degree of vulnerability due to climate, um, but also the ones that are better prepared to do something about 
about it, that have tax bases and political will that will invest in infrastructure and will invest in those kinds of things. And what I want to talk about really to you is, is not go through, of course, these all these factors because you know it, but I want to talk about is sort of how we communicated this or how we tried to talk about this with the private sector. Because as a journalist at heart, my rationale ultimately for joining Climate Alpha was to be in the room. I wanted to be in the room with the very large institutional investors and actually hear what those conversations sounded like. Find those leverage points. If you hand me that lever, where is, where is that place where we can basically anchor it and start to move all of that private capital to invest? And again, we could discuss the political consequences of this. Uh, Hannah and I were starting to discuss this because you see, for example, the United States post-pandemic and post-global financial crisis, you see entities like Blackstone, uh, of course, there's BlackRock with its ESG, which I'll come to, but entities like Blackstone are now commissioning home builders to build entire communities of single family rentals from scratch to address the kind of shortage of affordable housing that Calandra underscored there. Now, should we be building those communities in Phoenix? And should we be building them in Florida where the demand is? Or should we be trying to convince Blackstone that the long-term wealth to be created in this is to build them in resilient communities in, say, I don't know, Vermont, if you can get the uh, housing permits to build there. And so this is sort of our pitch is building off these kinds of things is that your real estate portfolios are at risk. We will help you identify exactly the kinds of prices over the long-term scenarios. And that's what our tools actually build. I'll spend the second half of my talk showing you more sort of how the tools comprise. But we really want to show this is what's at stake for you as an institutional investor if you stick to your current portfolio. And here's what we can do to identify long-term value for you. And, you know, we use the language of this, the Minsky moment. If you're familiar with the work of Hyman Minsky, um, of course, an economist figure who is really sort of touted during the global financial crisis, the Minsky moment is when all the value you thought was real is marked down in a moment of calamity, uh, a sort of black swan level effect, as Taleb pointed out during the financial crisis. And, you know, there's been lots of signifiers that there is a climate Minsky moment coming. I think I'm, I was I was blackpilled by Sean Bichetti, the former chief economist uh, of um, Freddie Mac, I believe it was at Freddie Mac, you know, looking at some of the early results out of Florida and arguing, like, would we see an orderly repricing of risk and orderly repricing of value due to climate change? Or would there be opportunistic sellers and then panic selling in the market? And being an American, I believe that panic selling is the American way. And so we were trying to basically figure out how do we actually get to that more orderly stake? And this is the kinds of tools we were bringing there. So that gets really the crux of our message when we sat down with these investors. Where should you sell today to avoid the hazards of tomorrow? And I'll, I'll cover a second thing. Where should you invest today to own tomorrow's most resilient real estate? And that was our message. There is an opportunity in... I guess we could say maybe semi-managed retreat, market-managed retreat, not managed retreat, and we think about it, but how do you start thinking about this now? And, you know, we sort of spoke in this regard, escape stress geography, there was, you know, there was an internal deck that used a different S word for this. Um, but we probably bring it up, and this is me is really telling is because in many of our conversations when we're in the room, a lot of the conversations started with ESG teams of very big investors. And what we quickly found out is that the ESG teams are totally siloed off from the real decision makers and firms. And increasingly, the real results of the Republican-led campaign to demonize ESG has been to basically minimize and uh, you know, push aside the actual ESG teams. They are not the decision makers in the room. One of our first tasks as a startup was to figure out how to get to that. And that, hence the slide here, the idea of the real ESG is adaptation and migration, uh, not necessarily the mitigation as much. And, you know, you know again, we sort of, we try hammer this point home here that, you know, that when it comes to all the sort of demographics that Calandra and others have discussed here, that, you know, that really we'll, we'll start to see the sort of orderly decision that climate climate risk will become more and more of a factor into people's home buying decisions. And, you know, Redfin, for example, if you know, if you've been following their work, they actually published a paper recently, uh, Daryl Fairweather, who's their chief economist, a climate migrant herself, she said very publicly that she moved from Seattle because of the wildfires and now lives in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. Um, she partnered with Matt Kahn of USC and others to run a natural experiment using their own searches, where they actually provided a climate score to home searchers in, I believe it was Gulf, Florida, Louisiana, and, and Gulf, Texas, and basically showed that, you know, that if you show people a climate score, they will actually look at, at properties rated with very high scores, and they will then go to look for properties with slightly lower scores nearby, that there's at least some rational decision making happening there, which we thought was interesting. And inform sort of our home product. But this gets back to sort of like really the cold hard proposition that Climate Alpha made to investors, which is the idea that the most valuable asset in the future will be climate resilient geography, that real estate is the foundational asset class of the entire global economy, and there will effectively be less of it, and it will be higher priced, and you should get there first. And our thinking of this, I mean, part of the thinking of this, I'm not an investor in the firm, 
Certainly the investors of our $4 million seed round are thinking that there will be money to be made in guiding and, and basically writing subscriptions into the SaaS tools of these large scale investors and they will reap profits off this. But also our thinking was that yes, we need to actually spur that kind of investment now. And I'll talk a bit about quickly, well, I talk about quickly here because I have the other half of my slides there, is that we've also gone to great length to actually put these kinds of tools in the public sector as well. We partner with Calandra and Statebook to make sure it gets in front of her customers. We partner with MasterCard and their City Possible program to basically make it very available at lower cost to public officials there. Um, I'll show you our sort of climate risk resilience scores that we make available. We've made it free for you know every zip code for county level managers so they can understand this. And I'll talk about some of the use cases for them too, because we see this as as opportunities, not just for private sector land banking, let me use that to talk about them for a second, but also public sector as well. You know, where should you do that kind of site selection that Calandra talked about? You know, if you've got IRA money coming to you, where do you site you know, your future clean power sources? Where do you actually site the most uh, resilient signs? And you know, quickly, I want to talk about two customers here. This sort of shows like how we're being used or where we think it could be used. Our initial launch customer was Lennar. Um, we worked with Chris Marlin, who was the head of Lennar International at the time, the arm that went out and basically sourced international investors for EB-5 visas and other ways of basically getting foreign money to U.S. projects. And we basically did a land banking analysis for Lennar. And I don't know, not to speak too out of school for posterity, but one of the things we found, and this is what I think is interesting, is that you know while this was a high-level project commissioned by Lennar, it did not ultimately get traction inside that organization because home builders and real estate brokerages are ultimately local. You cannot convince a real estate broker in coastal Florida that they should direct their clients to more climate resilient geographies inland or in Northeast United States because that will not help them. They are local realtors. So there's some really work to be done here in understanding, of course, or further understanding some of the localized incentives that exist in organizations in various fields where you can find that kind of traction. And then second, you know, the opposite end of that, the, you know, one of our first customers and our ideal customer was Nuriel Rabini, best known as Dr. Doom for his predictions of the global financial crisis. He's now chief economist of a firm called Atlas Capital, and Atlas is literally building products designed to be the most, you know, hedge resistant financial products around. And Rabini will talk very publicly that there's, he expects more than a trillion dollars of stranded assets due to climate change and migration. And that basically, you know, that investors should target this kind of a resilient geography. And so he's building this whole bushel of products, including trying to figure out what kind of real estate's there. So they commissioned us to help them build a REIT index, looking at like something like grading, I think the top 5,000 or 50,000 commercial real estate investment trusts based on their exposure to climate based on our analysis. So, you know, these are the kinds of things how the, how the private sector is playing it out. Insurance is to me like the bluntest instrument watching these big write downs happen. Um, the question there is like, how do you move to the carrots? And where do you find the influence to get them from doing this because I'll stop as a final story. You know, one of the first calls I was on was one of one of the big commercial real estate brokerages. And they asked somewhat sheepishly, our clients ask this to us a lot. Can your tool tell us the last moment to get out of Miami? Like that was the question. Like, how do we stay? And, and it strikes me as everything, right? Like the hottest geography in the United States. How do we stay in it till the music stops? And then we pass the bag to the public sector when that's over and the values start to decline. And you know, what we ultimately realized somewhat depressingly, and this ties back to all these presentations, is that you know, South Beach and Miami has resources, has money, has migrants. There is the ongoing investments in climate adaptation there. Places like Louisiana, which have much less of that political and economic capital available, will actually more likely suffer some of that unmanaged retreat. And, you know, and that our tool ultimately, and the, this is my personal opinion, our tool, of course, can't ultimately make that political decision. You cannot use the data alone to basically drive that. It is going to be these factors of culture and politics and all these other deeper factors that Liz pointed out at the very beginning of the talk. And it's been very educational for me to sort of see that, you know, that the money will, is not driving the conversation ultimately. And, and as a final note, there's Spencer Glendon, who is at Wellington Management, who now has his own thing on this, had warned me of this exact outcome. When I was at the beginning of this process, Greg, the institutional investors cannot save us either. They are ultimately not as responsive as we hope. So it's up to us, I guess, to save ourselves. So with that, Patrick, it's time for panel moderation. Monica? All right, great. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for the excellent, excellent presentations. Uh, would you all please uh, come up to the front and uh, sound for some questions? Great. Great, thank you. All right, so, um, yeah, so, uh, so I, I, I wanna, 
So how we're going to do this is we're going to have some um, a few questions that I'm going to ask. We're going to abbreviate that a little bit because I want to make sure there's time for people in the room and people who are watching this remotely to get the answers from their own questions. So I'm going to pick one of these randomly. Um, and I'm going to ask if you guys can uh, keep your responses, if possible, to maybe two or three minutes, um, just so we can kind of get on, get everyone a bit of a chance here. So uh, Liz, so if other geographies could incorporate your lessons learned now, what actions should they be taking to preempt a crisis of their own in other states? So obviously that's a huge question. Um, that's why I asked it. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, so I think one of the things is to start candidly talking about what the realities are. Um, you know, Louisiana, part of the reason that these migration questions are not a future scenario in Louisiana is because we've been experiencing land loss for decades and generations that wasn't tied necessarily to climate change, but more the mismanagement of the ecosystem. Um, and so uh, people had personal experience with disaster and uh, the ripple effects and the narrative of moving one town up the bayou, um, for example, was one that is like, Palatable. I guess that is for us a pathway to meet people where they are in conversation. And I think that is, though not using the same talking points, likely replicable in lots of other places it is like, what are the things that we're already experiencing? How does your personal experience with the climate reality connect to broader institutional um, pathways to address it. Um, you know, there's a disconnect, uh, as many of the folks in this room know, between, you know, someone someone will say to you in the same moment, like, I, I don't want investment in government, and like, we don't need, need bigger government, and also, where's the line of government people waiting to help me elevate my home or build me a levy or buy out my house, right? Um, and I think we don't talk enough about the ways in which those two things are integrated, um, and uh we are then subject to the stories of uh of folks who would who would want to tell the story of not investing in government for various reasons right um and so i guess the biggest thing is is having conversations and meeting people where they are and linking those personal experiences to the institutional and systemic pathways to actually address the unique challenges in those places excellent thank you uh haley uh let's see how would how are rising insurance rates more broadly impacting local responses to climate change? And specifically, you know, I'm, I'm thinking we talked about using, we've used the word a lot, Paul Thomas is saying managed retreat. So I'm thinking maybe about unmanaged retreat for a bit, kind of like the less, you know, less planned aspects of what we're talking about. So do you want to address this? It's like how it's impacting the local responses yes. to climate. Um, I think it's kind of hindering a holistic approach at the local level because we are seeing kind of this it's it's kind of chaotic when this happens people don't have anywhere to turn for their financial protection for their mortgage for their insurance and people are moving out of these areas where they cannot get a federally backed mortgage they can't get insurance and that you know, leads to a loss of tax base, government services. And I know we talk about that broadly in the context of climate change and the um, inability to, you know, plan effectively for managed retreat or for the relocation of communities. Um, we're having these tough conversations in parts of Louisiana now, like, do we consolidate these two parishes into government? Even parts of um, maybe more populated areas are combining their courthouses and like multiple parishes have one public defense office now because there's not enough people. And on that part of people leaving, there aren't people coming in. You know, there are still safe places and there's still great places in Louisiana that are not as heavily impacted, but this happening at the local level impacts the whole state market and in turn drives the conversation of are people going to come to Louisiana? Can we attract people to come and do the work and support the economy, support the people in places where it is still safe to live and still would be a viable community going forward? Like we see this in New Orleans, which has robust storm protection, but we see population losses there. And so I think that failure to holistically address this, the failure to fund local government in a way that's meaningful, like I said in my presentation briefly, 
manufacturers are exempt from property tax almost 100%. They have not paid property tax as part of our constitution. If they qualify as a manufacturer, they don't have to. And so we're we give the benefit to massive companies and corporations that work in our area, but we are seeing at the household level, people get driven out. And so that's not really an answer of what to do, but that is what's happening at the county level. And so I think it really brings the question of not just what do we do about insurance, but how do we holistically address local funding, infrastructure, and community support at that level, especially in places in the state that people want to be and that do have a you know more reasonable basis for continued investment and development. Great, thank you. Greg, um, I, we talk, you talked a lot about uh, Climate Alpha, specifically about residential real estate. I'm kind of wondering if you can address, address a little bit um, any work or thoughts that's been done in terms of um, supply chains, in terms of organizing the supply chains, public infrastructure, things like that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was just say, left it out. We were, you know, Climate Alpha started, and I should note, obviously, it's part of this larger trend, which uh, uh, Haley's colleague at Tulane, Jesse Keenan, once described as like the climate risk analysis arms race. Like, you know, I should note the Climate Alpha is part of that 2.0 wave after Moody's bought many of them. And you have other firms who originally started as, as again, B2B. We, we got a, we started a homes product, which you can go and plug in your address at Climate Alpha Homes anytime you like, if you want to see what your climate adjusted risk score is um, of your neighborhoods, et cetera. But the big focus is a lot on commercial re commercial real estate um, and not just, you know, offices, et cetera. But, you know, now we're out there actually writing op-eds. We're trying to put out thought leadership on this very notion that really, uh, obviously, if you are doing site selection for, say, your semiconductor plant that the United States wants to build to basically decouple from China, perhaps you should not do it in Arizona, which is exactly where it's going right now. Um, obviously, you know, I, I enjoyed reading Axos's coverage of this, arguing that Phoenix was the city of the future if it can solve its water challenges, which struck me as a pretty big if at the bottom of the story as a journalist. So we're the ones writing out there being like, you should use our tools to basically help you conduct this site analysis to not to combine in a single platform, both really accurately underscore that water risk, but also identify the kind of workforce development and other sort of characteristics that are important to you. And again, Calandra and Statebook do something very, very similar to what we're doing and very closely overlapping there. So, so yeah, so we're using this to really right now identify like, you know, uh, yeah, and score the kinds of various regions that are best suited to these kinds of emerging supply chains. And just so one example of that is um, electric vehicle batteries. If you're following this, like the IRA has, you know, triggered a huge amount of investment to this. And, you know, you see, you see geographies like Quebec, uh, where I keep a residence still, uh, and then like the Southeast United States are building these whole supply chains. So we're offering that to clients there. We're talking to investors about, you know, where should you think to be about investing in industrial properties? You know, are you better off making bets in Georgia or in Quebec, et cetera, because we're in Canada as well. So these are the kinds of tools there in, th in terms of thinking about like, you know, what are the available factors of this, helping them decide this and that sort of scoring as well. Um, I don't know, is there a second part of that? I can give time back. No, yeah. no, that, that, that's great. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and last, last but not least, Calandra. Um, so, you know, um, I kind of wondering if you could um, go into a little bit. And I, I, um, I know you kind of touched on this earlier, but we just go a little bit deeper in terms of uh, how do we measure impact in order to plan more strategically in the future? Yeah, it's a it's a very interesting question. And again, the federal government is targeting all future grants essentially across all the different agencies, HUD, Department of Agriculture, um, Department of Energy, Department of Transportation, Economic Development Administration, they're all targeting the communities with the most hazard risk and that are the most disadvantaged, right? So that doesn't mean 100% of the money is going there, obviously, but you need to make the justification that you've done that analysis. And so in terms of measuring impact, right, that's always a big question because then it's like, okay, we spent all this money, where did it go? And historically, there is not a lot of benchmarking, measurement, et cetera, that goes into that sort of follow-on equation. Um, it has started to change a little bit where tax incentives are concerned, right? So now, Often there's so much more scrutiny after, I think it was 2012, the New York Times did a huge expose, a three-part expose on tax incentives, which is literally all of our tax dollars, not all, but a lot of tax dollars going to some of those large companies that Haley was referring to, right? The manufacturers, especially 
to lure them from one state to another, from one country back into the United States, et cetera. So they get these huge, these huge tax incentives that are drawn out over a long period of time. And now, finally, because of the increased transparency there, there are clawbacks, there are reporting criteria that they have to meet and so forth. The same, I think, is going to be starting to be analyzed toward federal dollars and where those investments are going, particularly as it relates to uh, disadvantaged and, and climate risk communities. Um, and so the fact, the big question is like, how do we measure that? How do we benchmark that at the local level? And how do we attribute those uh, impacts, the actual trending data over time to the actual investment, right? So there's always a decoupling of what is the impact from the direct investment and what are the ripple effects or what portion of a, of a, of a statistical trend, whether it's growth in incomes or changes in the types of industries or where people live or the demographics of the population, whatever it might be, how much is related to the impact and how much is related to other factors. So there is always a challenge there, but I think just being able to benchmark and track the dollars and what is happening, the trend, what trends are actually happening over time. And that's part of the conversation that we're having now, literally today with FEMA and EDA and other agencies on how do you track and measure that and you know what types of uh, requirements are going to be put in place for being able to do that over time. And we saw a little bit of that just really quickly with opportunity zones, which was a big tax incentive, right? And even to this day, they haven't announced all of the uh, reporting requirements that will be uh, put in place to be able to get the money out of those investments. So there's still a long way to go, but I think it's it's on its way and at least the conversation is being had now. Great, great, thank you, thank you. All right, uh, so um, does anybody in the audience have questions? I think we have, a, we have the mic up there. People are gonna, people come up here to the mic and um, ask your question. I'm sure. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ellen McRae, and I'm the Regional Climate Services Director for NOAA in the Eastern Region. And um, I actually work as part of our data center. And so one of the conversations that we're having now sort of directed at you two as private sector data users is, first of all, where do you think the line is between what the government should provide in terms of data access and where do you think that private sector should pick up? Um, and also just what kinds of data do you guys think that you would like to have in terms of the access so that we can better improve that service and transition to the private sector? I'll answer after you. <laughs> so great question. Um, we, when we first launched Statebook, uh, we, we got a contract with the Federal Department of Commerce. And to this day, they are still one of our favorite customers because we get all their data for free and we sell it back to them because we make it useful, right? So, but other departments in the federal government when we were first launching, which was back in 2014, they looked at our data and they got really grumpy and they said, if the Department of Commerce were doing their job right, this would be their website, right? So the question is really well founded. Like it's very hard for government, I think, to make the data useful. The departments are siloed. Department of Education data is next to impossible to use as a lay user. So having a company like Statebook take that data and make it useful is incredibly valuable. Um, then being able to bring together all of those federal departments and normalize the data across the whole country so that the user doesn't have to be a data scientist or an analyst or you know a tech worker or whatever. They can actually just get in and use the data transparently sourced so they know it's a trusted source from the federal government or a partner like Climate Alpha um, and visualized and in a way that is, is you're able to look at and analyze any community across the country at whatever geography level. So, I think the private sector being able to actually bring all of that technology, get investors to buy into that it's a good idea, and then build the technology 
to make the data useful is incredibly valuable. The more data, the better. We've already, that 32 billion that I had in my slide is actually an old statistic. We've exponentially added more data since we had that data point. I just don't know what the, the new size is. Um, so really the more data, the better. And I think though, what's really important to consider as it relates to data is five years ago, even it was data, data, data. How do I get my hands on all this data? Now it's, holy cow, there's a lot of data. What is it telling us? And so it's much more about the insights and working with our data partners, our customers, et cetera, to understand what they need to get out of the data, what insights are important, and then being able to visualize that. So it's not, you know, the more data, the better. We're always taking in more data, but really what's the use case? And my chief economist always starts with every customer, with every data partner, not, you know, what data do you think you need, but what problem are you trying to solve? Because chances are they don't know what data they need. So let us figure out your problem and then we'll apply data to that particular problem, make recommendations and assemble it in a way that is useful to get to the bottom of that and then to be able to track and benchmark the, the impact over time. Yeah, I'll just go quickly. Um, I mean, in terms of in terms of data, we would want. I'll start with the second half of that. Uh, obviously, you know, I'm not I'm non technical, so I can't get into it too much. But obviously, flood. I mean, I think like many other modelers, flood is the hardest piece of it. And we found when we launched uh, the Homes product that you know the dealing with hardline coastal zip codes that that level of resolution, right? You're still like sort of zip code collection, and then dealing with some of those coastal ones, you could end up with you know a home on one side of the zip code on slightly higher ground. I mean, how floodplains change, you know, it sort of still throws those models into into a bit of havoc. There. So, you know, cracking that, which I'm not sure how to do, is, is that's the piece I think that we have the hardest time with with our models. Um, and then when it comes to, you know, in terms of that line between the public and private, um, I, I think Calendra answered that well. The way I would answer that is I've been thinking a lot about this in the context really of the, like the EU AI Act and other proposals of regulation of AI, because we do a lot of machine learning. That's the crux of what we do. And, you know, uh, you know, as, as the chief communications officer, I was the one having hard conversations with people like the Times, Christopher Flavel, and like Bloomberg's Eric Rostin about, well, aren't you guys just another black box? You're taking public available data, and then you're mixing it up, you know, in, in, in uncon inconceivable algorithmic black boxes. So I think the big piece of it is I'd love to see once we get, you know, or if we're seeing governments start to pick up the slack here, I'm like, how do we deal with generative AI and how we should regulate these models? You know, I think there should be a much stronger conversation here about with the government that it has to be open and transparent up until a point or defining these various factors when it comes to flood, smoke, I don't know, some, some sort of agreed upon set of risk factors that must have transparent modeling involved. Because we've published some semi-technical white papers on this, but ultimately it's, of course, it's the secret sauce like all these other firms. So I would like to see government decide there where if you're using public data as part of your models, you have a public obligation up to a point to make it semi-transparent so that we can do an analysis the same way we can already do analysis of some of the various public, you know, large language models that are out there. Um, so something like that. I'm curious, like how that conversation will translate over. So I know this wasn't a question for me, but I just want to add to your flood data Please. point because the HUC 8 and HUC, HUC 12 data that hydraulic and hydrologic modeling that's being put together as part of the Louisiana Watershed Initiative um, could be really usable in terms of modeling projections for future development, um, especially in the context of the insurance crisis and where people are able to get access to insurance and where we're continuing to exacerbate our existing flood risk by developing in areas that are increasingly vulnerable. Um, that in my opinion should be something that the public public sector provides and that is usable uh, as a platform for the average residents and is supported by local and state government partners in the sort of planning decision frameworks that actually allow residents who are willing to consider the prospects of moving elsewhere uh, to be able to do so and then find pathways to actual grant making and resources that are connected to uh, those opportunities. Great, thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, do you wanna? I'll make it quick. Um, hi, and thank you guys so much for your presentations. I've got, you've given me a lot to think about. Right next to the mic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you guys have given me so much to think about. Um, my name's Lee, I work for the Urban Land Institute. Um, I saw you like two weeks ago. <laughs> but um, I, I wanted to one say, so the city of Boston has actually put out some interim guidelines for using generative AI. So thinking about that specific issue, they, there are localities that are already putting out 
um, guidance on that. But my question is actually, um, uh, so ESG teams are not decision makers in the room. And um, the question is then who are the decision makers when it comes to operationalizing climate risk data for commercial and residential real estate asset managers and investment managers? And um, just for the sake of it being a more uh, universally applicable question, um, you know, are there any others in other industry sectors who we should be paying attention to in terms of operationalizing this data and the analytics um, and making it, you know, translating it into like real tangible solutions? Okay. I'll, I'll tackle that first quickly, and I hope others have something to say. I mean, that's a, a huge question, and thank you. Utilized on some great work, by the way, with uh, on modeling these kinds of issues with uh, my friend Mary Mary uh, Ludgett and Heitman and others, and uh, using 420, 427 in that particular case. Um, yeah, I mean, when it comes to the ESG teams, I mean, the answer there is every firm is different. It all goes back to like the tacit knowledge and structure and power pathways to the various firms. I mean, obviously, we've seen that the power lies, you know, typically elsewhere in other teams. I mean, the general... You know, the, you know, when it comes to real estate firms, it's like, you know, the acquisition board, whoever's in charge of like, sort of like making final approvals on this. Um, yeah, I, again, we've seen sort of various, various power structures there. Um, to your point there, I mean, I, you know, the thing that I've seen the most interesting, and I can't name the firms because I'm under NDA, but like I've seen, for example, the output of various foresight teams in very large developers and home builders where they were the first ones that really told me that something was starting to change, hopefully here, where they were suggesting that, yeah, the, the American demographic flows, the Sun Belt might someday reverse. And then what would these firms do? Those people have since been, you know, again, sidelined, forced out of those firms, et cetera. It does not trickle back up to the people at the top with the massive cognitive dissonance. So, I, you know, the real short answer to your question is, is like, this is this is exactly what Climate Alpha is doing. Um, you know, the, part of the reason I left Climate Alpha is that, uh, you know, it went, it started as really a sort of big meaty questions about manage retreat. And now like many other startups, it's in search of product market fit. How do you take your, you know, high level ambitions, incredible technology and address it to the very granular questions at being asked and by, by decision makers in various firms. And every startup grapples with that to find, you know, that right fit for that. And um, we're finding it, but like, you know, I, I, again, I think many, many of the teams, I'll make one final note on this, you know, many of the customers are early ones we've had are people who have been customers of Moody's and others who know because of pressures coming down from the Fed and Treasury and the SEC Gary, under Gary Gensler that they need this kind of data for, you know, for compliance, but they don't really know what to do with it. We'll figure that out later, they tell themselves, and we're trying to help them figure it out. So that, I think, is a big education piece. We've managed to convince them that they need to do this, but they do not know why they need to do this. They only know the government has a big stick. So I don't know if anyone has better thoughts. Calandra. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. So I just had kind of a quick aside. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about ESG because I think there are very important criticisms and also of, of the ESG model and also the attack on ESG by particularly like more red states. Like in Louisiana, we're seeing this happen. In Texas, they passed, I think there were two bills that passed in 2022 that prohibited municipalities from like issuing bonds like funded by banks with ESG policies. And so on the one hand, ESG is on shaky ground because states are moving in a way to like prevent ESG from being part of its public decision-making and, you know, the SEC is going to have a climate disclosure rule. Where is the climate disclosure rule? It takes time to make federal regulations, but with how the Supreme Court is turned right now and what's happening at the federal level, I feel like any you know big step for federal regulatory power or oversight for laws that aren't specifically written for that purpose will get challenged. So we have that issue. And at the same time, we see ESG, most of those commitments do not have any, you know, meat behind them. There's no enforceable mechanism. Like we saw the big three or the big four oil and gas companies with all have varying levels of net zero discussions, renewable investments, and um, that sort of commitment reporting their highest quarterly profits ever in the first quarter of 2023. And then the subsequent, well, you know, we're not actually going to be reaching our net zero commitments by 2030, or we're not actually investing in this, like we're taking a step back. So it's being attacked and that's bad, but it's also not enforceable, which is another issue. So yeah. it really 
raises a lot of like complicated questions about what role ESG even has and like what that will do in the future of our climate decision making. It doesn't create perverse incentives to divest without actual reinvestment because I've seen that too. It creates it creates a risk avoidance framework of like this is bad, we need to get out of it, but then that capital goes gets sidelined effectively too. Yeah, and I would add that what we see, so there's so many different aspects to ESG, right? And it means something different to everybody, it seems. But um, on the corporate side, every single corporate report says we're committing $300 million by 2030 or now being pushed to 2050, right? Um, for to go carbon neutral, because that's how they got their head around the E. But the E is so much bigger. It's the E is everything we're talking about in this conference, right? And then the G is like, oh, well, if we have a racially diverse board and, you know, leadership and whatever, like that's how they're dealing with the G. But again, it's so much bigger than how they're kind of pigeonholing it. And S, everyone's like, what's S? Nobody knows what S is, right? And so that's where like, we're kind of as deep book, we're kind of making that play of like, okay, we can help with the S, right? We've got all that data and you can leverage it. But I think, you know, on the flip side, on the both, any kind of sort of um, the building side of the equation, right? Like I, I did a, a, insurance is driving that discussion finally. Right. But even so, I did a presentation to a YPO uh, real estate developers. Right. So these are some of the most successful real estate developers in the country at a conference in one room. And it was right when everything was kind of coming down in Florida with the insurance stuff. And so I, I had these slides and I was covering the topic of the day and they were all just like hundreds of real estate, the top real estate developers in the country, they were like, wait, what? Florida's not going to insure our buildings anymore. And I was like, guys, like, this is your business. And I, so I said, show of hands, who's got investments in Florida? You know, pretty much. And they were like, well, that's the fastest growing market in the country. And I was like, <laughs> no, like, this can't be your measure, you know, like pay attention. So I think it's a complicated issue. Yes, again, ESG is just sort of one of those amorphous things to a lot of people. They're not paying attention. There needs to be more guidelines. There needs to be more structure around it. And I think somehow standardize it if we want people to be able to embrace it, just like I was saying earlier with the economic development organization, city and county leaders, right? It's a concept, but that doesn't mean they know how to deal with it. I just want to make sure that it's top of mind for all of us in this context, right? That most of the people that are getting access to this data are people with tremendous resources. And that unless we're extremely intentional about dismantling systems of oppression in the context of how we adapt, we will be perpetually exacerbating the existing inequities that are already built into every facet of our society. Um, and so just as you think about the complexities of everything we've talked about, please walk away with the understanding that like, we all need to be figuring out how to center that question in whatever part of this work that we do. Okay, last so, last question. I think we have a, right. an online question. And by the way, Calandra, can we just use that face palm earlier as like a emblematic thing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this is an online question being asked by Allison Furon for Haley. For subsidized disaster insurance, do you feel it would be impactful if it would only insure existing existing housing stock to avoid the Miami example you mentioned? That's also a very tough question. Um, I don't have a great answer for that question of how to apply like a model of subsidized natural disaster insurance. Um, we're seeing that 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 FEMA is looking at, you know, incorporating maybe land use and that kind of development aspect into national flood insurance regulations, which I think, you know, again, there's a whole question of what regulations will stand in this political, you know, economy that we're in right now. But um, we've the seen second, in the second panel is going to talk about this, though, right? I think a little bit, but um. I think it's really hard to draw arbitrary, like to draw those lines between like, how do you fund existing things? Because we are going to be seeing development happen and whether you base that on the 
whether someone can relocate into a 500 year flood plain or outside of a spe like a special hazard area. Um, I think that there, I don't think there's a really great answer for that. I'm hoping someone else in the panel following will have a better answer than I do, but um, I, yeah, I, that was not even an answer to the question. No, no. <laughs> I'm so sorry, but um, I think you can't really draw the line between that, like what's existing now and what will be built later because we don't have, you know, set development plan or a set policy, even really at many state levels of how to do this. So I think, you know, hopefully we'll have a more nuanced approach where we can really address that in the future. All right, great. And, and, and I don't know is a, there's no shame in that. That's a great answer sometimes. I think we need more I don't know sometimes. Uh, anyway, uh, so thank you all for attending. This is, uh, can we so first of all give a round of applause for our panelists? All right, uh, stick around for part two, which is gonna start at 3.30. So thank you, thank you everybody. Here, are you in part two? What? Are you in part two? No.